and I think there is a meeting chat. I can't actually see it, um, the view I've got of the presentation right now, but I think my colleagues, Bethany in the background, um, they'll be able to keep an eye on that and uh, deal with that maybe. Um, so if you've got questions, you can leave it to the end uh, or pop it in the in the chat and we'll pick it up from there. So right, where was I? Um, yeah, putting it in the context of the climate emergency and what the council's doing in relation to that. So, you know, it's a good couple of years ago now, I think the council um, came up with some pretty clear and impressive um, targets for going carbon neutral as an organisation by 2030 and zero carbon by 2040. I think that was about uh, 10 years ahead of the uh, government's national targets. Um, and the main priority for the council is to implement initiatives that encourage our residents to take responsibility to reduce the overall household waste that they produce and engaging with residents on how we can support them in this. So whilst composting doesn't really reduce the amount of waste that you've produced as such, home composting certainly reduces the amount of waste that the council has to manage. So it links in with that loosely. Um, then also we've said we will engage with the public around the costs, benefits and drawbacks of new approaches to waste collection, including food waste collections and green garden waste services. So again, composting can be a, uh, a, a something that happens via a collection service and is done centrally. Um, but the focus of this presentation really is more, I will cover that a little bit, but it's more on home composting. Um, so it's not so much a new approach to waste collection, it's actually trying to eliminate the need for that collection so far as is practicable. Um, so that's the kind of high level strategy commitments. Um, the council then developed a, an in-depth kind of action plan. And within that, uh, there is a there is a, a commitment to reduce the quantity of household waste collected per household through the promotion, promoting and encouraging home composting of suitable food and garden waste via the free supply of home composting containers and gaining feedback on the barriers to achieving further carbon reductions through increased levels of home composting. So we have recently launched a trial of, um, we've given out about 100 free home composting containers and the residents that have accepted those containers are committed to giving us data back on the amount of food and garden waste that they've managed, managed to divert from their dustbins. Um, so we're going to quantify how much waste are we not having to manage through this initiative and try and put some carbon saving figures on that as well in terms of, you know, that you're eliminating the carbon, uh, any kind of waste collection related carbon emissions for that material. Uh, and there may be a difference in the processing emissions as well. I'll come on to that. <clears throat> So there's also, you know, that's the climate context, also a bit of waste context here. Um, so the council's waste collection contractor, Serco, collected a little over 70,000 tonnes of refuse in 2020 stroke 21. That's April to March, the local authority year. That's not, that's not the recycling, that's just the refuse they collected. So of that refuse, a little over 30,000 tonnes was found to be food waste when we do our waste comp composition analyses occasionally. On top of that, there was over 5,000 tonnes of garden waste. So you add those two together and you see it's over 50%, around 51.5% of all the refuse we're collecting is actually food and garden waste, most of which can be composted. I say most because it, you know, it's things like, you know, the much woodier stuff or cooked food, meat, fish, etc. We'll come on to a little of that, but most conventional composting techniques um, or in practical terms for your average householder, you can't necessarily compost all of it. So what is composting? It's the natural decomposition of biodegradable waste under oxygen risk rich conditions. That's opposed to oxygen lacking conditions or anaerobic conditions, uh, which tends to be known as uh, anaerobic digestion. Um, so it's another process we can send food waste to, um, but we're concentrating on home composting here. And I, I might mention the anaerobic digestion a, a bit later on. 
Um, so the compost you produce, that's the product of the controlled aerobic bio, biological decomposition of biodegradable materials commonly used to fertilise and improve the soil. Um, <clears throat> so it's one of the big benefits. If you don't have your food and garden waste collect, collected, you can actually use it to help feed your garden soil and encourage good, good kind of plant growth. Um, so that all sounds very good, but I've, I have put a note in here that you know, it's worth remembering that composting does actually uh, release CO2 direct to the atmosphere. That's as, really as part of the short term natural carbon cycle, so it's not quite as concerning as carbon emissions from fossil fuels. Um, but it can also produce methane if the process becomes anaerobic. So a well managed home compost heap is, is should probably can be considered more kind of eco friendly than a poorly managed one or one that's going anaerobic. So the impacts of organic waste. Um, now I've taken some of these figures from the uh, published um, Zero Waste Scotland carbon factors. Um, because there's there's only so many kind of published data sets out there, but this one is particularly easy to interpret in this kind of context. And clearly they're providing different figures for different processes. Sometimes there's just kind of one figure for a whole load of different processes. Anyway, in terms of generation, food waste is really pretty bad, I have to say. Um, so on average, they think there's about 3.7 tonnes of carbon equivalent emissions per tonne of food waste generated, uh, so approaching four times as much. Now, that figure is going to vary an awful lot depending on what the food waste is. That's a typical basket of food waste. But clearly, you know, if you've got a, a tonne of um, Brazilian beef, for want of a better example, it, the figure is going to be a lot higher than a tonne of apples that have fallen off the tree in your back garden, for example, um, or a tonne of seasonal um, non-dairy or non-meat um, food waste is likely to have a figure much lower. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in contrast to that, garden waste, the figures, they, they tend to put a kind of zero figure on that. Um, with food waste, most of the impacts are probably in terms of the, the importation, um, the, the chilling, the processing, the packaging, all kinds of things like that to actually get it to the household. Whereas garden waste, um, they put a, a zero figure on it really because um, it's grown in your garden. There, 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 was, there wasn't any of that packaging, processing, chilling, etc. Um, it's grown in your garden. It could rot down in your garden if you leave it there. And the net carbon impact of that is going to be near zero. I mean, if you're operating a heated greenhouse in your garden, the figures are going to be very different depending on how you where the energy comes from that but most of us aren't doing things like that in terms of the collection it's much harder to put a kind of carbon figure per ton um, but you can see from a previous slide um, if you could take all that material away and put it to some other process or you know home composting um, you'd have less than half the amount of refuse requiring collection that would mean a lot more, a lot fewer dust carts required to do it, a lot fewer staff, um, and fewer dust cart miles. Um, you could ask, you know, you, you could ask questions about well, and you might, you might be able to do it less frequently, for example, but you'd still have a um, fair bit of nappy and hygiene waste in the residual waste that people wouldn't want hanging around too long. So, but even if you were going to stick to the weekly collection of residual waste, you could potentially save a lot of carbon. Uh, one of the big savings is so many fewer trips to tip off the lorry and empty it before coming back and continuing the round. Now, in terms of disposal, um, beg your pardon, um, you've got a, nearly a tonne of CO2 equivalent avoided for every tonne of food and garden waste that you divert from landfill to incineration with energy from waste. Um, so that's the change that the council has already implemented. I forget exactly when, but it's um, it's probably pushing 10 years ago now, I think. Um, so when you put organic waste to landfill, it tends to generate methane. 
a modern landfill will try and capture that methane, but it's not very efficient at capturing all of it. The figures I've seen are between kind of 20 and 70 percent of the methane might get captured. The rest goes to atmosphere. It's a much more powerful greenhouse gas than the CO2. So by shifting the main refuse disposal from landfill to incineration with energy recovery, there have been some huge carbon savings, we believe. What we're actually looking at now is diverting food and garden waste from incineration with energy recovery to a home composting process or possibly um, a collection process. Now, the, the government has been talking about mandating um, compulsory garden waste collections. Um, that isn't law. It's just it's something contained in their kind of national waste policy. It's not law yet. Um, so we could be forced. We we could that that's one potential route the council might you know, have to or choose to go down at some stage in the future. But um, home composting is probably the easiest and the most environmentally friendly option, not least because it eliminates any collection related impacts. The more we can persuade people to home compost food and garden waste, uh, that does actually potentially generate some pretty whopping um, waste disposal cost savings as well. So basically it's the, the cost for disposing of a tonne of waste at the energy from waste incinerator plant, or to put it through that route, is about £157 a tonne these days. So multiply that up with the 30 something thousand tonnes of waste and you get a figure of about £5.7 million annually just for disposing of that material. Um, now obviously when it, when it goes for incineration, uh, the calorific value is being used to uh, generate electricity that's contributing to the national grid. Um, the carbon contained in the material is straight up the chimney. We're not able to capture that at this point. It's a you know, technology that's being worked on by the by the experts at that end of the field. Um, but also all the all the kind of nutrient value of that food and garden waste is essentially lost. There's no capture of the phosphates or anything like that in the material. Whereas in composting, you are trying to capture that uh, as much as you can. So the benefits of home composting, you've obviously got the free supply of compost for the garden, reduced demand for commercial peat based composts, which are uh, the government announced recently going to be phased out by uh, 2024. So we, we won't be able to buy the peat based ones. I guess that will build the, dem the demand for the waste based ones. Um, rather than buy a waste based one, you can produce it in your back garden. Um, so there's improved garden soil quality and biodiversity benefits, I think, especially when you're using an open heap or a heap that isn't very kind of sealed into one of these purchase containers. Um, what I tend to find is that you know, you'll get small flies, not the kind of biting variety or anything like that, but small fly, flies are attracted to the heap and then you might get, you know, fly eating birds or bats uh, attracted in to eat the flies. Um, you've also got the soil microorganisms, worms and wood lice and all sorts coming up from the soil um, and having a good old munch on the material. In terms of carbon, um, as I've mentioned, it's really the avoided collection related carbon impacts. Um, in terms of the Scottish, the published Scottish carbon factors, I think it was about, I forget which way around it was, but I think it was about 15 kilos of carbon potential saving per tonne of food waste diverted from incineration to recycling, and about 30 kilos uh, for garden waste. So basically, when you think of that in, in relation to 3.7 tonnes carbon saved if you avoid a tonne of food waste, 15 kilos is actually pretty small beer. Um, compared to the saving of actually avoiding the production of that waste or indeed diverting it from landfill to an incineration process. Um, so it's, I think worth bear, bearing in mind that the, the potential savings in terms of the process are actually potentially quite small. But the reduced waste collection and disposal costs, I have to say, are actually potentially quite large. 
So just kind of ranking the the options for dealing with organic uh, waste, what are the treatment options and how do they compare in terms of carbon impacts? The worst option is landfill. Big improvement to incineration with energy recovery, as I've said, um, but you can get further improvements beyond that. The next step really is anaerobic digestion that would actually um, that's far more suited to food waste than it is garden waste. So it's really a, a food waste only option um, that biodegrades the material in the absence of oxygen that produces methane. But when you do it in an, a controlled enclosed process, you can capture all that methane and potentially feed it into the national gas grid um, <clears throat> or power your collection vehicles that are trundling around collecting the food waste. Um, and that's what happens. We're, we're actually um, just, just launched last week a food waste recycling collection trial in one part of the borough, the, the Southfields grid as it's known. And that service is delivering the food waste into an anaerobic digestion facility in Mitcham, which as I say, feeds the gas into, that, into the gas grid and powers its own collection vehicles, which are collecting food waste from businesses in, in the capital. Um, after that, you've got you've got the centralised composting option and home composting. I've ranked home composting as the lowest carbon impact process, and I'm pretty confident that that would be true, providing it's not going anaerobic, um, because central centralised composting processes do tend to be well managed because um, they're monitoring the temperature and the moisture and everything and turning regularly and. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm now going to go through a, a few of the um, composting options in a little bit more detail, starting with centralised composting that would have to link in with a, a garden waste collection service. Um, it's not so open to food waste, and that's all to do with uh, really legislation around the animal byproducts order. So it really stems from the problems with foot and mouth. Um, must be the best part of 20 years ago now, I would think. Um, but yeah, there is significant risks in spreading poorly composted meat waste back onto agricultural land that might have grazing animals. So you keep the food waste out of that. Um, and you can see that that picture, you'll have specialised machinery to turn the rows. They're all very neat. Everything is um, uh, put through a shredder beforehand, so you get a wonderful particle size. It doesn't matter if you know big sticks and things were in there. It's all chopped up to you know kind of um, wood chip size that really composts very easily and actually compost uh, complements the kind of wetter kind of um, grass cutting type material that tends to be in collected garden waste. Uh, there's a big question around if you do go down that route, should you charge for your garden waste collection service or not? Uh, tends to attract a few headlines, that one. Um, open windrows, that's just what they call these um, parallel rows of composting material. So you'll get the freshest material in at one end, the finished compost at the parallel line at the other end, and they're slowly turning the lines in one direction with the finished material being taken away at one end. Um, so yeah, highly controlled process, so a, a good quality of composting as a result. Even though you, you haven't got that much control of the incoming material. So home composting, I've started with approaches that try and uh, try uh, uh, attempted to really be designed for all the material you, you might be producing. So the photo at the top there is known as a green Johanna, and that is designed to accept all types of food and garden waste. I think the difference is with a compared to a conventional composter is I believe it may have a kind of basket that has to be dug in to the ground at the bottom. I think it may be kind of insulated to keep the temperatures up in there as well. Um, but I would think that you, you can't just you know get all your garden waste as is and chuck it in there and expect it's all going to work very well if you've got woodier material for example you'd probably need to put that through a chip or a shredder to get the par particle size down enough to really make it work in there 
Another option for all types of food waste, but no garden waste, is the green cone. Again, that has, has a little kind of laundry basket type arrangement that has to be dug into the ground at the bottom. The reason for those things is really to make the container secure from scavenging animals. So it should be secure and prevent any rats or anything getting in there and providing a, feed, a food source for them. But one thing I, I would say about the green cone is I see it's, it's marketed as a, a form of composting these days. I believe it used to be marketed more as a kind of digester. So I think when, when you put lots of wet food waste in there, there is a high risk to my mind that that's going to degrade anaerobically. So you may be releasing methane to the atmosphere as and when that happens. So it's just a, a, a little flag to wave there, I think. Going on to more conventional approaches, um, the picture at the top there is a, um, I forget what they call them, a, a compost bin supplied via the uh, Wandsworth's offer. Uh, it's called Get, Get Composting. It's available online if you go into the council's website on the composting section. Excuse me. Um, but yeah, there's a, been a discount offer in place or a reduced price offer, I should say, for many years. So you can get hold of one of those delivered to your door for I think it's around about £22. Uh, and you'd struggle to get it cheaper than that anywhere else, I think. Um, but you don't need to buy one of those containers. And of course, in carbon terms, it's made from fossil plastics. So there will be an impact associated with the manufacturer at least if and when it's uh, disposed of in an incinerator. Um, so you don't need a kind of plastic purchase container. You can purchase wooden ones, different designs, or make your own picture here using kind of corrugated um, iron or steel, I think. Um, another popular approach is kind of a wooden pallets, if you've got space to do it that way. Uh, I'm, I've been living where I've been living for about two years now. I've still got an open heap. I haven't contained it in any way. Um, I don't regard it as much of a problem, but my aim, I think, is to to do a chicken wire approach. So I, I think I'd, I'd intend to put kind of four posts in the ground and put chicken wire around them and contain it that way when I get around to it. Um, so yeah, that was that was the kind of what, what I regard as the conventional approach to composting, and you can do that if you've got a garden. Uh, many people in Wandsworth don't have a garden, but they might have a balcony. And whilst I think you've probably got to be fairly dedicated, if that's your only kind of external private space, um, not everyone's going to want to fill that up with a wormery, but some people might. And I think as I put here, it's a uh, picture. You know, if you've got young children, it's quite a fun educational activity to do with them. Um, again, it's, you wouldn't do garden waste like this. It's food only, um, no meat or dairy or liquids, but cooked food and bakery products apparently are okay for worms. Um, they don't like extreme cold or acidic citrus peel, so you do need to be a little careful. And in the winter, for example, I think it will help having a blanket over it or something, just insulating them a little bit will help keep up their level of activity. And I think the, 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 the second picture there, you can see it's made up of kind of layers. So you feed your food waste into the top layer and as it rots down, you know, you'll get the, the finished compost at the bottom, but there'll be an active layer which the worms are attracted to. And you can kind of see how they're getting on there. And once they finish that layer, they'll start to move up. And as long as you keep feeding new material in, they'll move up, but then you'll take the bottom layer out because that's now finished compost. So they're, they're a bit like gerbils on a wheel. They're constantly going up, but never reaching the top. Uh, this is the, the, the final approach to kind of um, home composting I wanted to say a little bit about. Um, known as Bakashi, I think originating from Japan. Um, but when I looked into it a little bit, I decided it's not necessarily a strictly a pure composting process. It's actually an anaerobic process uh, that relies on inoculated bran to ferment kitchen waste, including meat and dairy. Um, so it's, it is just about all forms of um, 
food waste can go into that. Um, and they call it, they, they say it process it into a safe soil builder and nutrient rich tea for your plants. So I think you can tap off a liquid from it and use it as a, a, a kind of natural organic liquid fertilizer to mix in with um, water that you're using for watering plants. Um, I think elsewhere I, I saw they, it was referred to as a, a pre-composting process that you could then just take the contents of your Bakashi system and add it to an external composting sim, sim system. But I couldn't necessarily see the, the, the real advantage to that. Is it just an extra complication? And obviously you can only do that if you've got an external garden. I think the you know this is particularly a system for managing the food waste in an enclosed space where you, you can't deal with it externally. <coughs> And you do have to add a Bakashi brown as well. So I think it's you know, given that it's it's the kind of thing you do indoors where you haven't got any outdoor space, it's probably for the more for the committed end of the resident spectrum. Um, I'm, I'm impressed with anyone who's actually managing to kind of compost internally. So really to focus now on the kind of the most conventional um, form of composting that um, you know the kind of container you can build yourself or purchase easily and um, some of those other containers I was showing you are actually much more expensive than the low 20 pounds that you can get one of these for. Um, the first thing is where, where are you going to place the container? Well ideally it goes on a sunny well-drained spot but I don't think that's entirely ne necessary and for many people you know that might be where you want to put your nicest flowers um, and the only real space you've got for your compost container might be rather more shady, possibly even on a hard surface. Well, I don't think that matters too much. <coughs> Excuse me. The shade is just likely to slow the process down a bit. You can always try and adjust for that by adding an activator um, or just accepting that it's going to take a little bit longer. Um, again, on a con on, siting on concrete or on a patio is fine, um, but you do want the kind of soil organisms coming up from the soil and if, if they can't do that then adding a bit of soil into the base of your composter before you start putting the fresh material in should enable worms and what have you in there to actually percolate into the into the garden waste and start feeding on it. Uh, in terms of what to include in a conventional approach in terms of food waste, I'd say it's everything except this list, which is liquid stuff such as oils and soups, uh, cooked food, meat, fish, dairy and bakery products. So if it isn't one of those on the list, I'd say you can include it in conventional composting, shouldn't cause problems. There are one or two other. I mean, eggshells tend to be a bit slow. Um, I think uh, seashell scallop shells for example can be quite thick and you know they might they might last quite a while in your compost heap but um, um most of us aren't producing too much of that either don't put it in, in the first place or it's not too difficult to pick out at the other end um garden waste i've taken a similar approach everything except and some things you really do have to be very careful about for example invasive and controlled species particularly japanese knotweed not least because there's specific legislation around dealing with that. Uh, you don't want to get into any legal trouble. So yeah, if you've got Japanese knotweed, follow the precise advice, don't home compost it. Um, other pernicious weeds, I think you can you can be a bit more what works for you kind of thing. So if your emphasis is you want to ensure you're producing a compost that doesn't contain weed seeds in, then you do need to be pretty careful at not not allowing them in the feedstock kind of thing. Um, if you get the temperature of your heap up to a really good composting temperature, you might actually be looking at killing those seeds, but it's difficult to kind of guarantee those 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 kind of temperatures um, on a on a home compost heap. Um, so yeah, so a little bit of choice, but if, if you're happy, if you're not too bothered, if you're thinking, well, weed's going to come up in my flower beds anyway, it's not going to make much difference if I put 
compost on with a bit of stuff, then I'd say, you know, that that's that's a legitimate choice on your behalf. My approach uh, last year, um, I'd, I'd put tomato, old tomato plants and chili plants in the compost. And what I found this year is I did have some of those plants popping up in strange locations, but I didn't really regard it as a problem. It wasn't too difficult to pull out one or two of them. So uh, um, woody items thicker than twigs, I think, can be a real problem. Uh, there's a very easy solution, and that's um, using a chipper or a shredder. I think the issue there is, well, you've got to store it. It's quite expensive. You've been talking hundreds of pounds to buy one. They can be very noisy as well, so you might have to consider your neighbours when operating one. Um, but in my experience, it's the kind of thing that enables you to compost all your garden waste or thereabouts. Um, if you don't have access to something like that, you may find some of your garden waste is just a bit too woody to home compost. If you don't have one, you can uh, chop up, you know, thinner items with a pair of shears or or garden secateurs, that kind of thing. Secateurs, it can be a bit of a slow process, but if you've got a big kind of pile of bushy material that isn't too woody, chop, chop, chop with a pair of shears, and that can actually get the volume right down so it's much more compact and in a you know, smaller particle size, a much more easily compostable form. Um, the only other things, two things I've listed there are evergreen tree cuttings. Um, they tend to be very slow composting, as do waxy leaves such as um, holly. Um, so it's not that you absolutely can't put it in there. It's just that if you do, it could take rather longer than a lot of the other stuff in there. Um, so again, it's just taking a view yourself, what's going to work for you. If you want your uh, finished compost product quite quickly, say within, you know, perhaps six months, probably leave those kind of leaves out. If you're prepared to wait a year or two, probably those leaves should be fine. Um, just a few more tips on how to make it work. Uh, mix, mix the wet food waste and grass, uh, grass cuttings with drier, woodier annual growth, particularly if it's been chipped, then it works really well. Or a bit of sawdust, that kind of thing mixed in uh, would, would provide the right kind of balance. Uh, turning the heap occasionally, uh, I think how, how occasionally you do that is again a matter of choice. Um, I think anything up to every few weeks if you really want to um, get maximise the speed, um, but every couple of two or three months perhaps if you're not too bothered about how long it's taking. And some of it might depend on, you know, if you've only got one of these um, purchase containers like pictured here, it might be, well, you're, you're quite happy to let it go as long as, as long as it likes until the container's getting full, at which case you're starting to think, what am I going to do with my garden waste? I'd better speed this up a bit. Um, so yeah, I've covered chipping or shredding, I think, cutting up. Um, add a bit of water if it gets too dry. Again, with these contained, um, the, with these kind of compost containers, it tends to seal a lot of the moisture in, so it reduces that issue, but it can increase uh, the issue of getting enough air to it. So there's m more need to turn the heap, I think, when it's in one of those enclosed containers. If it's in a more open heap, you can probably just kind of stick a garden fork in and shake it about a little bit. Um, so yeah, add activator if desired to accelerate the process. Um, but in terms of detailed composting advice, I'm inclined to kind of leave it at, at leave it there and say, you know, there's plenty of detailed uh, good advice online from various organisations. And the two we'd uh, particularly recommend, I think, is the Horty, Royal Hawkerty Cultural Society and Garden Organic. Again, both of those links are on the Council's website, uh, but I think we'll be circulating this, um, this presentation of, uh, at some point afterwards. Um, so yeah, how long does it take? Is it ready yet? Um, I think that's, that's partly a matter of choice, but if you look at the material, if it's all gone dark, uh, that's a very good sign. And if you look at the woody material in there, if you take, you know, whatever kind of twiggy things you put in, if it snaps easily between thumb and forefinger, that's a good sign. It's it's lost its kind of its tough structure. It's largely broken down. It might still look much the same, um, but it's it's good enough uh, if, if you're happy 
to accept it looking like that kind of thing. So what I've often done is, um, you know, if there's stuff still in there, if it generally looks good, if there's stuff still in there that's clearly still wood, it won't snap that easily, then I'll kind of pull it out by hand probably. Um, the remainder, I probably get in a big pile and get a, 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 a garden spade and just chop it up a bit. So those kind of twiggy things that are still in shape get broken up. Uh, and then I think you're ready really to use it as a mulch on your on your flower beds or do whatever you want to do with it. Um, so I think that's just about it. Um, now I had a, a, a reminder from our climate team that we're, we're, we're encouraging positive action pledges. So um, if you're committed to home composting, your food and garden waste as far as is practicable, um, please make a, a pledge or just tell us that, that that's the case via the, the chat on this presentation on, on the, 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 the team's chat and we'll kind of take that away and add up all these pledges and, and uh, perhaps see what that means for uh, moving in the right direction for the environment. But anyway, that's that's the end of my presentation. So thank you very much for tuning in. And I think the floor really opens up at this stage. Uh, if you put your hand up um, and turn your mic on uh, when we speak, when, when, when you're picked, um, or perhaps my colleague Bethany might pull something out from the chat as well. So let's see what questions we get. Yeah, yeah great, great. Thank you, thank Mike. You, Mike. Um, um, so I think so I we'll think pull a few, a few out of the out chat, chat and then we can open it up to the floor as well. Okay. Um, so we've got a question about the free compost bins that we've been giving out and who should people contact to get a free compost bin? I'm not sure if we've given them all out yet, Mike, or not. So perhaps you can answer that. Yes, I think we have given them all out. Um, so that was about 100 for this um, trial. However, uh, some people did find when they received it um, that it was a little bit bigger than they'd anticipated and they changed their minds. So whilst they're still part of the trial and they're going to give us the data on what they're managing to compost, um, they didn't want to do that composting in the container we've provided. So we, we had to take a number of them back um they may be available for any uh, once with residents that put their hands up first um because i think we've just got them in storage back at the depot or something i'm not quite sure where they are so without making any guarantees if somebody wanted to put their name and address forwards um and saying i would like to take one of these if i can the only other issue i'd flag up there is that um, for a while in connection with that project and other projects, we had a van on hire to do a few deliveries and take things back. We don't have that van at present, so it might well be a question of if you want one and you're able to collect it, we may be able to give you one for free. But literally, I'm talking about five or six of them or something, I think. OK, great. So if they email you, perhaps, Mike, do you want if we uh, put your yes, email address? Is that the that best thing? Be absolutely fine. OK. Great. Um, so we've got a question as well about uh, whether the council will be offering food waste collections in the near future um, and also about whether that's easier for residents to do than home composting. Yeah, uh, it's a, a very good question. Uh, take the, the latter part first. Is it easier than home composting? Uh, yes, I think it is in that both involve separating your food waste out in the kitchen. Um, the collection approach just means you you empty that container into a larger container that you store outside and we collect that once a week and take it away for anaerobic digestion. The home composting approach says that you simply empty that container into your home composting bin, um, but then there's a little bit of the um, extra involvement in terms of turning your compost heap occasionally um, but you know the advantage being you actually get a product at the end of it, um, whereas if you give it to the council, the product is in the form of gas fed into the, the gas grid. You're not seeing a personal benefit direct from that. Um, obviously, there is a wider benefit from it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, in terms of the, is the council going to introduce a service? Um, it doesn't have any plans to at present. Um, no decisions have yet been made. Um, the Southfields grid trial may uh, hopefully will cast some light on, you know, if if the council did go down that road, 
what are, what is that going to look like? Um, how much could we expect to get back? Because there's an awful lot of food waste collection services that might only be getting about 30% of the available food waste. 60% um, remains um, or 70% even um, going in with the residual waste. So we're trying to answer some questions with that trial about you know how successful would it be if we went down that road um but yeah no decisions um to actually go down that road at present um i can't anticipate future decisions of the council obviously there's elections coming up in 2022 so there might be some clues in in the manifestos um but there's also the national waste strategy so there was a a government proposal to make food waste collection services a mandatory service for councils to provide. Now, if the government goes down that route, obviously the council won't have any choice. Um, but the council, if we do have a, a new waste collection contract uh, scheduled to commence in April 2024, um, so hard decisions will need to be made around what are the services we're going to put in the specification that we want uh, contractors to tender for. Okay, thank you. Um, and we've also got a question from Barbara about what about people who don't have a garden or a balcony. Um, I think you've covered that a little bit in terms of some of those alternative options. Um, but is there anything I should say on that? Uh, I'm not sure there is. I think really the well, the, there there is one more. So there's there's the Bakashi option, <coughs> but I think you have to be fairly fairly kind of dedicated um, to kind of put space over in your small flat to that and make it work. Um, there's the possibility at some point in the future of food waste collections, but when I say they tend to have fairly low capture rates, that's generally with um, conventional housing. When you try and do food waste recycling at blocks of flats, the experience um, elsewhere data from other local authorities and things suggests that you get an even lower um, capture rate of the food that you're trying to recycle. Um, so I'm not sure that's the answer either, but the other option I was going to mention was food waste macerators. Um, so they're very popular in America. I'm told about 50% of homes have them, but basically it's a, a device that sits under your kitchen sink or it's, it's kind of connected with your kitchen sink um, and it basically chops up food waste and enables you to dispose of it with um, the wastewater. So that doesn't need to be home composted, it doesn't need to be collected by the council, it just goes into the sewerage system and ultimately ends up where all that material is going. Now in the past, I think Thames Water, and I think Thames Water still produce a dry kind of sludge cake, um, which they incinerate. But they were talking about switching to an anaerobic digestion process. Now, if and when they do that, any food waste in, uh, that, that's put through a macerator would actually help them generate methane at the other end and could actually increase value for them. Having said that, they do tend to be quite paranoid about uh, blocking up old Victorian sewerage pipes. So it can depend on the kind of uh, building you're in. But it's a very easy, convenient option within the home that enables you to just get rid of your food waste immediately and you eliminate those collection impacts. However, there is significant water and electricity usage involved in operating one of those. Mm, OK, that's useful. Um, we've got a couple of questions from Diana. Um, so one's around how do you capture the methane from a green Joanna if you can? Um, and also a question about the compost activator. What is it and are there different types? Uh, yeah, good questions. Um, yes, yeah, so the green Johanna, I think because you're able to put a mix of all food and garden waste in there, you can potentially keep that mix as a good kind of compostable mix that stays aerobic. So I think you would want to turn it or fork it or you know help the air into it occasionally. But the fact that you've got food and garden waste mixed together means there's a good potential for an aerobic process. 
uh, whereas with the green cone, you've only got food waste going in there. So I was just flagging a bit of a question mark over to what extent is that um, decomposition going to remain aerobic? I suspect it could get a bit kind of putrid anaerobic, um, which is fine for the rotting down, but I think it does imply methane release to the atmosphere, which you know, it's only going to be relatively small quantities, but we need to be concerned about these things and you know try and factor everything in when we're looking for the best solutions. Uh, in terms of the activators, uh, you can you can purchase activator via the get composting, um, you, you know, uh, special offer um, between the council and yeah, get composting. Um, so it's the purchased options, um, but other options can include things like um, comfrey. It's just composts really nicely, apparently. Um, Urine, um, it's, it's high in nitrogen. Um, it can, so I think you, know, you wouldn't add that to, say if, you, if, you're, if what you're trying to compost is largely, say wet grassy material, that's already high nitrogen, you probably wouldn't want to add urine. But if your compost heap contents is largely woodier stuff or sawdusty, you know, we've been using a chipper on, you know, twiggy hedge growth and stuff, then quite possibly, a bit of uh, that kind of thing added in is going to help the mix. Another one was um, uh, hamster or uh, guinea pig gerbil droppings, anything like that, rabbit, um, that can be quite good, but you would not want to put in anything, you know, human, dog, cat, absolute no. Um, so yeah, there's certainly natural activated things you can potentially put in there. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a question from Lydia about uh, the collection of garden waste. Um, and so if garden waste is going into your normal waste, how does it get disposed of and what's the carbon impact yeah. of that? Yeah, um, so yeah, the council's policy is that uh, residents of the gardens can put up to five bags of garden waste out per week uh, as part of the normal service. Uh, you won't be charged from, for that, we'll just take it away. Um, so that garden waste gets mixed in with all the other residual waste, including the food waste. Remember my figure, over 50% of this residual waste is food and garden waste. Um, the dust carts initially go into Smuggler's Way, the waste transfer station there. Um, all the waste is compacted into um, you know, international ISO containers, the big kind of back of lorry things. Those are craned onto river barges. The river barges go down to uh, Belvedere and Bexley, utilising largely tidal power. So that is a very kind of um, efficient transport process because they take huge numbers of, of lorries off the roads. Um, but they are, they're diesel barges uh, or diesel tugs towing the barges. So it's not pure tidal power, but that's where most of it comes from. Uh, but anyway, it gets down to the Belvedere incinerator. Um, where yeah, essentially it's burnt, but they are um, generating, you know, they're driving um, turbines to generate electricity uh, from the heat that's produced there. Um, and that, I think, if I remember rightly, the, the calorific value from the waste being burnt from Wandsworth is approximately sufficient to power it was round about 15,000 homes, could be up to about 17,000 homes, but it's, it's of that kind of ballpark. OK, thank and you. So, yeah, so, sorry, just to add in, in terms of the carbon there, um, so that process puts just about all of the carbon in the material up the chimney to the atmosphere. If you compost at home, I think an awful lot does um, get released to the atmosphere as well, but some carbon does remain in that you know more carbon remain, remains within the compost than it does within the burnt ashes at the incinerator kind of thing. Um, so as I said earlier on, the, the the carbon difference between the incinerator and home composting as a process is actually surprisingly small, 15 to 30 kilos per tonne, according to the um, zero waste Scotland carbon factors. Okay. Great. Um, so I'm hoping I'm not missing anything in the 
chat there's quite a few different questions i'm sorry bethany i'll just add one thing to that though that in terms of food waste whilst those carbon savings from the process appear to be fairly small those are generic figures and the council is in the process of trying to get a bit more of a local handle on that try and actually what what how do they has it actually translate when you look on the ground in wandsworth um what was the other point i was going to make there um pass uh, might come back to me <laughs> okay <laughs> Ask a follow up question. It's Lydia on the same question. Um, so if you take your garden waste smuggler's way, is it disposed of in a different way or does it go down the Thames in the barges the same way? So is it better to basically take your own garden waste to the dump or is it better to leave it out for the collection? A very good question. I'm pretty, sh pretty confident the um you know, it's a separate it's western riverside waste authority operating that facility not the council but i'm pretty sure that does go to a composting facility last i heard it was open windrow composting in Raynham, essex or in that that, that kind of direction um so yes there is a, a kind of environmental advantage small carbon advantage but you know the other composting benefit is you know that material can be used on agricultural soils and what have you to reduce the reliance on chemical fertilizers and things like that um so that, but the downside would be if you're taking it to the tip you're probably going to have to do that in a car and there's liable to be an impact associated with that so how it how it really pans out in terms of carbon i i i couldn't put a figure on that thanks very much Great, thank you. Um, so we'll take a couple more from the chat and then um, we can open up to any more questions. Um, so we've got a question from Cindy just about will share slides be shared afterwards, which yes, we will do. And we have been recording as well, so we should be able to share the recording at some point. Um, we've got quite a few people just saying, yeah, Bakashi is not for the faint hearted, um, which <laughs> I think is reflects what you've said there, Mike. Um, and uh, Victoria's asked a question. What are your thoughts on hot composting bins? Uh, another good one. Um, well, I haven't got any direct experience of hot composting bins, um, but I have discussed them with a colleague at the um, Western Riverside Waste Authority. Uh, so they were trialling one for a while, trying to decide are, are they something that the waste authorities should be promoting? and they struggled to keep the temperatures up. So I think their their verdict wasn't entirely positive. That's, you know, not, not to say they're, they're in, in, entirely a no-no or they, they simply don't work, um, but the, the Western Riverside experience of them wasn't entirely positive. So I don't know why that was, whether it was the insufficient volume of material or the, the type of material they were putting in, um, but they tried to make it work and it it didn't wasn't entirely successful so okay thank you um and we do have lydia as well in the chat saying she has a hot composting bin and really likes it so okay yep, we've got yep. mixed verdicts but okay. yeah <laughs> thank you um and ollie's asked is it okay to take leaf waste from the street to provide a brown supplement for home composting um and amy has said as well i guess you'd need to watch out for plastic rubbish and cigarettes getting caught up but is there anything else you'd say on that mike um yes uh, it's, a, it's a, another interesting good question um the the thing i'd flag up um just from my local authority knowledge is that the environment agency some years back was did a whole load of tests on street leaves i think i think it was mainly in wales um but they concluded that street leaves are typically so contaminated with uh, pollutants from road vehicles. I can't remember exactly what was in there, but um, you know whether it's oils leaking out or the kind of the exhaust um, matter contaminating them, but um, they actually ruled that it wasn't possible to send these things to a composting process or they, they shouldn't be sent to a composting process because of the level of pollution in them. Um, now, whether that 
should stop you from doing it in your garden. I'm not so sure, um, but I thought I should flag that up. Um, yeah, the only other thing I'd say is if you, you know if you're you're pulling stuff off the the streets, just be careful with you know you don't know what you know if people have dropped needles or anything like that. Um, just make sure you're careful using gloves and, and things like that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I think we're happy to open up to the floor for any more questions. And um, Michael, I don't know if you want to stop sharing your screen so we can see everyone. Uh, okay. Wants um, to. Um, so feel free to put your hand up if you wanted to ask a question. Oh dear, am I still sharing my screen? You are at the moment. Um, um, let me just get that off. Uh, yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go. Has it stopped? Yes. Brilliant. OK, so anyone feel free to raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Yep, yep, Victoria, yep. About um, garden rubbish, normally I take um, the garden rubbish myself to to be recycled, but does it have to be in a special container to, if one wants it collected from outside one's home? Uh, no, not at all. Um, the only the only real kind of specification from the council on that is we will only collect up to five bags equivalent. Um, so it might make it a bit difficult for us to count if you've mixed it mixed it all in with, bag, you know, if the bags are half of garden waste and half of other stuff. But um, yeah, so ideally it's separate bags of garden waste. But as long as there's no more than five five refuse sack equivalents, that should be fine. Um, green bags. So that no, it doesn't it can be any bag any any refuse type sack. Not one of the clear recycling ones, please. <laughs> OK, uh, and Amy, you've got your hand up. Oh, I'm trying to show my face. Um, so when you said five bags, how do you know what's inside the bags if they're black bags? Um, that that's that's something for the men on the ground to try and determine, I think. Um, good point. And then, when you do get them, um, do you open up our rubbish bags then, like to separate the garden waste to the general home waste? No, they're not. I mean, I think for the most part, they, they're, they're quite experienced on the ground and they can kind of tell almost without looking kind of thing. But generally speaking, it will all get collected. Uh, but if, if they can see there's more than five bags of garden waste there, they are fully entitled to only collect five bags of it. But you're right, right, it's not always easy to tell what is and isn't garden waste. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to switch off again. <laughs> OK. Uh, so I think, I assume, Amy, that's a legacy hand. Um, I can't see any other hands up at the moment. Um, but if anyone else has anything else they want to ask, Mike, this is your opportunity. Um. Yeah, another question for Victoria, that's fine. <laughs> um, the rubbish is put into um, containers, um, not into plastic bags at all. Um, and uh, uh, and then it's so to av avoid too much plastic. Is that something that um, Wandsworth Council has thought of a different way of collecting collecting the um the recyclable rubbish i think it's certainly considered um you know all sorts of options but um plastic free containment of waste is not very easy <coughs> excuse me um so what we've got at the moment is single use plastic sacks we provide them for the recycling and the vast majority of households are purchasing them privately for the refuse. Um, and I think even where you've got, um, you know, lots of author local authorities these days um, provide a wheelie bin system. But my impression is even where wheelie bins are used, most households tend to put the rubbish in a in a black sack before putting it in the wheelie bin. Um, so whether or not and of course, wheelie bins are made of plastic and there must be many, many plastic bags uh, 
would would make the equivalent of a single wheel bin in terms of the quantity of plastic. Um, so no, the council hasn't got any you know particular plans or anything to to change the the method of containment. But as I said, there is a new contract uh, due to commence in April 24, and it's roundabouts now that the council has to start thinking about what we want that that contract to look look like. So I think at this stage, no decisions have been taken, but we're getting to that point in time because it's a very long process. If you want the, the contract to start April 2024, you've got to award it at least six months before then to give them time to buy the dust carts. Um, you've got all this tendering process before then. Um, but yeah, you've really got to get going a good two years or so before, before you actually want the service to start. Um, and yeah, I can't, you know, there'll, there'll, there'll be an election before then. I can't predetermine, you know, what the view of the council will be, but um, no plans to change that at present, to my knowledge. Okay. Thank you. And we've got hands going up all over the place now. So <laughs> um, I think, Cindy, you had your hand up. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to follow on from Amy's question. Um, we have tried to put our uh, garden waste and composting out, um, but the bin men don't collect it. They just leave it. So that's, I thought Victoria's question was very good because, you know, is there a better way that we can market or are they now being told that this is really important and they really need to pay attention? How will Sorry. we follow are you, up? Are you saying that... Um... Your, ref, your, your other refuse gets collected, but a bag of garden waste is left behind. Correct. Um, well, that, that sounds like the service going wrong to me. Um, I, I would hope that as a, a simple, you know, if you went online, you know, report miscollection or partial, partial collection on the, the kind of council's web form for reporting problems with the waste collection service. Um, you know, if you're, say, for example, if your collection was due on Monday, and you find the garden waste was left behind, if you fill out that form the following day online, that should be sufficient to ensure that they come back on the Wednesday and take the garden waste away. Oh, OK, great. We will yeah. try that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and we also have uh, a hand up from Joanne. Moving on. So I used to live in Richmond upon Thames, and I know that we've joined them as as um, like a partner borough for um, the town hall and everything. And um, I was just wondering why we didn't join them for our waste collection because they do garden waste and food waste, and um, I just wondered if that was an option for in the future because you were talking about it. Yeah, uh, very good question again. Um, so the partnership, as you put it, I think is, is basically a, a single staff workforce serving two entirely separate organisations. But as you suggested, that kind of staffing structure does enable us to look at, you know, what what synergies are there, what potential efficiencies are there uh, that can be kind of banked through this kind of um, joint working, as it were. Um, when it comes to waste, there's a whole load of reasons why that's very difficult. Um, one, for example, was uh, there's two different uh, waste disposal authorities. So once was waste is has to come into the Western Riverside Waste Authority. Most of Richmond's has to be delivered to the West London Waste Authority. So there's different tipping arrangements. Um, very different kind of services. So and indeed um, contracts. So the, the Richmond just let a new contract. It started, I think, January uh, 2020. Um, so they let a new contract then, but Wandsworth's contract is not aligned with that kind of thing. So we've got a contract continuing until 2024. Now, in theory, Richmond could have let a contract to say, OK, the successful tenderer provides this service in Richmond, but Wandsworth will then have an option to join in on that contract when its existing contract um, terminates. Um, but I think there was just too many reasons why that wasn't going to work. 
another one is just the the kind of the scale of the efficiencies you need to operate that kind of service. Um, so a single depot, and you know, if you went right down to one contract for two boroughs, um, where are you going to operate all those dust carts from? If you continue to operate two separate fleets from two separate depots with two separate sets of management, where's the efficiency kind of thing? You're not actually gaining anything. But if you come down to a single fleet in a single depot, um, potentially you, you lose so much time in traffic, trundling, trundling back and forth between the boroughs, um, that again, you're not actually achieving an efficiency. So I think everything was looked at and it was decided that there simply isn't enough potential for efficiencies to actually make that worthwhile. Having said that, I think there is now one and it may actually be a first across the entire councils, but we are now letting or have just let a, I think it has to have just let, a collection contract for domestic clinical waste. Uh, and I believe that will, so it hasn't commenced yet, but it, it is likely, I think, to, um, yeah, I forget, it, it may even be it will operate in Richmond first of all, and then with the option in Wandsworth, but there, there is certainly the potential for one clinical waste collection contractor to collect all the domestic clinical waste across both boroughs under a single contract. Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, really good question. Um, uh, Amy, you've got your hand up again. I was just following on from Victoria's about the wheelie bin situation, and it goes away from composting just a tiny little bit, and I'm very sorry for that. Um, so in terms of, I understand like uh, waste, like black bin bags being put into a plastic bag, but recycling and maybe garden waste could just get directly put put into one of those big plastic bags and then you said about those big plastic bins about the the amount of plastic that is used in those one bins versus the amount of plastic bags but I think if you look at um plastic bags and how many plastic bags some households go through that's going to quickly actually I think um top the amount of plastic the hard plastic in those bins um and so that was one and then, so I promoted the uh, tonight's, um, the start of today on Facebook. And um, I think residents are very, uh, she came back and she said, well, this is, um, oh, what did she say? Uh, that it's, it's hypocritical because her bin just got collected today and all her rubbish got chucked in the back of a lorry with her black bin bag. So all her recycling and her black bin bag got chucked in the same lorry. And then there's people saying that now there's two compartments and when all the glass gets crashed, this is my dad's old time, get all the glass gets put in there, then it gets contaminated with the paper and then all of that. So in terms of the recycling and this lady's argument with the black bin bag, what is the argument? Because I did, I felt she was kind of targeting me, so I'm like, oh, should I go back? But I just said nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm. I'm not sure on the issue of the. Well, I, I think you've you've given me a comment on the the um, amount of plastic on bags versus bins, and you know, I don't really know how that sticks up stacks up. Um, but I wouldn't assume that a switch to wheelie bins is going to reduce the net the net plastic that the whole system is is using kind of thing. Um, but then the, re, the the bin will at least be reusable as opposed to single use plastic bag, which yes. I like I will refuse all plastic that I can. But that plastic bag is like probably the thing that I can't uh, step away from. Um, yes. It kind of gets forced upon us, although it's recycled. I know it's made from recycled materials. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. There was another aspect to your question, wasn't there? Um, uh, about, I guess, the reusing of the bin versus the single use of the bags, and then the lorry truck taking this woman. Oh yes, um, yeah, of course. The the yeah. So absolutely, there's a, a 50 50 uh, volume split on the back of the dust carts. The two equal compartments. Um, off the top of my head, I forget which side is which, but it will be standardised. We'll let you off. Yeah. Um, now, if a resident sees 
both their refuse and recycling going into the same compartment, there's two possibilities, I think. One is that they uh, didn't manage to sort their recycling sufficiently well to persuade the collectors that it was good recycling. So they may have picked up the bag and thought, oh dear, there's so much food waste or something in there, I'd better treat this as refuse, despite it being in a, a clear recycling sack. Um, so that's one possibility. The other possibility is that the, the collector isn't doing his job properly and should have put that recycling in the recycling compartment, but didn't. Now we do, we have, Every now and again, we get a, a, a report from a resident that sounds quite reliable. Really, I just saw this happen. They're putting all the recycling in the wrong compartment. And you think, well, why, why would they do that? Well, most of the time, there isn't much reason for them to do that. But if, for example, the recycling compartment is full and they're near the end of their round, do they want to go back to tip to empty the recycling to come back to just do a few more houses? or might they be tempted to put the rest of the recycling in them with the refuse and then go back to tip having completed their round. So they, you know, they, they might think like that on occasion, who knows. Um, Could it then be sort of like picked out? Could they highlight that and be like, oh, by the way, there's about 10 bags right up front. Will they then pick that out? No, if once it's in with the refuse, it's going to stay in with the refuse. But what we have done on occasion is when we've received a credible report, we've actually you know, called ahead to the tip and said, look, we've had this report of the dust cart in this road not sorting the recycling properly. So we are able to intercept it and get them to tip out the contents contents of the refuse compartment on the kind of tipping hall floor um, to see whether there's any evidence to back up what the resident has said. And I have to say, whenever we've done that, we've never been able to back up what the resident has said. So that's not to say the resident was lying or, you know, had, had got things wrong. But if the crew member had done that, it was a fairly isolated incident. And for the most part, that crew on that day was doing the right thing. Uh, sorry, I had another just follow up point about that. Um, sure. Oh, the so in terms of how people deal with their recycling then is there a way to maybe in the bright side magazine or in the ping of the emails to tell people how to correctly process their recycling and make sure that i know that the bags have the things printed on but maybe more in depth as to like yes and no lots i use the recycle now website but many people i guess have seen don't um, but is there a way to i don't want to use the word educate but educate um on the ways of the yes and the no's i kind of felt like she she commented this morning as well um about her recycling sack and she said that they were short staffed and that so she had called them up um oh. called you guys up and she they said that they were short staffed and they've just been told to that, that is true i mean I, I i've had that message myself only this morning um i was quoted quite how many people they had off um had, had short now i'm not because there's two things that can affect the waste collection contract one is the uh you know covid impacts you know and they have to be very careful because they're operating in crews so if one goes down with covid the rest of them have to isolate um but the other one is the general driver shortage as well um so there's been lots of reports of um waste collection drivers for local authorities being poached by the big supermarkets and things that are able to offer much higher salaries um so yeah i do know they are operating on restricted staff at times at the moment and i know they were today um i think that if like we knew so i think you feel a bit more like okay that's okay then we let you off <laughs> um, I think once people take to Twitter and stuff and start writing uh, without knowing the full extent, especially yeah, you can't we can't change what's happening. Um, you you feel a bit more okay about things. <laughs> I'll stop grinning. I'm going to turn off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So I think that's all the hands up, unless anyone's got. Any final questions for Mike? Oh, Ollie, yeah. Yeah, simple question. So as far as you're concerned, what does success looks like? I mean, if we all did exactly what you wanted, um, what, what would we be doing? 
Um, I think success from where I sit would look like a big reduction in the level of food and garden waste in the the waste stream that we collect, you know, within the the refuse stream that we're having to dispose of. Um, so if we can see those figures come down, you know, I quoted some at the beginning of the presentation about 70,000 tonnes of refuse, uh, 30,000 tonnes or more of food waste, 5,000 or more tonnes of garden waste. Um, if those figures come down, there's some potentially big savings in terms of the collection resource required to collect all the material. Um, in terms of what's actually happening in the back gardens, I'd say success looks like um, lots and lots of well-managed home compost heaps diverting as much of their food and garden waste as they practicably can. Yeah, great, thank you. And I can see Lydia's put something in the chat about have we heard of Olio? Um, yes, <laughs> we have. Um, and there's quite a few of those different sort of apps around as well, around uh, minimising waste, which is something we would really encourage for sure. Um, if we can stop it going into the waste stream at all, then that's the absolute best outcome in terms of carbon. Um, Robert, I can see you've got your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Just a quick clarification. I, there is absolutely no way in which one can do anything useful with uh, as well, you know, anything that has been cooked or anything like meat or dairy, you said. This is very frustrating because I just chuck them in the bin, whereas all the green stuff just goes into the into the compost. But you, there is nothing practical that one can do about that. Lot. Well, I think there is, but not via a conventional compost heap approach. I mean, you 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 can. I mean, I know my mum, for example, has a, has an open compost heap and she puts just about everything onto it. But I would think half the cooked food or whatever that goes on there or the meat scraps is more likely to be taken by a fox than to actually compost as such. And it's mm. not something I think the council would encourage people to do because obviously there's fox related issues in the borough. Um, I mean, again, bonfires is another one. You know, what do you do with the woody stuff you can't you can't compost? Well, um, we can't really encourage you to have bonfires because there's yeah. air quality implications and nu neighbour nuisance kind of implications and things. But the the options really I went through was, um, you know, the, the green Johanna can potentially deal with all food and garden waste. The green yeah. cone can potentially deal with all the food waste. The cashy apparently yeah. can potentially deal with all the food waste. But I think all the systems that deal with all the food waste with the exception perhaps of the green Johanna that's mixing in so much garden waste, you know, I think that there might be a risk that they're um, decomposing anaerobically with yeah. methane emission. Yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted to get it clear in my mind that I wasn't w w not taking opportunities that c I could take. Um, and clearly I'm not really. In, yeah. in, in real life, these things just... Yeah. <laughs> and I think as well, going back to the... Um, the relative carbon emissions uh, associated with food waste generation and the different options for dealing with it. Mm. Um, the biggest best solution on that side of things is don't waste meat, don't waste cooked food. Oh, try to eat it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Take that for granted. Yeah. Thank you. OK, uh, is there anyone else that wanted to ask a question? Uh, great. OK, um, Dan, I can see you put your camera on. Did you want to ask a question at all or no? That's fine. <laughs> OK, um, so I think there's just one more thing in the chat, Mike, about the bags and whether the bags that we use are biodegradable. I assume that's the recycling ones. Let me just go up. Yeah. Can you not get biodegradable recycling bags? Uh, I guess in, in theory we could, but we wouldn't want to do that because biodegradable plastic is an alternative to recycling plastic in effect. Mm. Uh, so whilst we don't actively um, ask residents to give us plastic bags for recycling, because we don't really have a, a good route for that, um, we are able to recycle the clear plastic sacks that we issue. Um, I think that's a bit easier because it's a particular type of clear plastic we get a much more kind of uniform 
bales when we kind of get get it by the ton. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're recycling the plastic bags that we get back. Um, that's why they're not biodegradable. Um, but also biodegradability could give us issues with storage as well. Um, we there's a risk that. Um, they start falling apart and by the time we get them to the household and they're actually using it, the bottom could be falling out. OK, thank you. OK, so we've got um, five more minutes until the end of our scheduled time anyway. So this is final opportunity to ask any questions. Um, Amy has put a feedback form in the chat as well. It would be great if you can give us your feedback um, on this event or any of the other events that you're attending. Um, that is always really, really helpful for us. Um, and Amy has also just put in a link to all the rest of our climate festival events taking place this week. Um, and I will do a special plug for our Sun, sorry, Saturday event, which we're holding at Battersea Arts Centre. And would really encourage everyone to come along to that. Um, and I'm just keeping an eye out for any more hands up. Can't see any. Um, so I think that is probably us done for this evening uh, and we can let Mike go. Um, as I said, please do fill in our feedback form. Really helpful for us to get that. And thank you all for your time this evening.